Our guest this week on Veterans Chronicles is retired U.S. Air Force Colonel Charles McGee. He is a veteran of World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. He is also a member of the famed Tuskegee Airmen. And Colonel McGee, thank you so much for being with us today. My pleasure, and thank you for the opportunity. Of course. Uh, let's start at the beginning of your story. Where were you born and raised? I was born in Cleveland, Ohio, but left there in third grade time, and my dad's work moved him to Illinois uh, through my first year of high school, then had two and a half wonderful high school years in Iowa and then back to Illinois. So I'm a Midwesterner, I get a Buckeye Midwesterner. <laughs> Well, I'm from Michigan, so I like the Midwestern part, not so much the Buckeye part, but well, oh, oops. <laughs> <laughs> but that's fine. Uh, what type of work did your father do? He was a minister in the AME Church and also a social worker. Okay. And he also served uh, in the war as a chaplain. Now, when you say you moved from Iowa back to Illinois, that was for college, correct? Uh, my last uh, less than a half year of high school, then college. Yes. And University of Illinois. University of Illinois, because state schools were cheaper in those days. I probably still <laughs> a, a bit, but I was able to work a year after graduating from high school uh, to and have enough money to enter my first year of college. And you joined the ROTC there, is that correct? ROTC was, yes, indeed. Uh, learned to handle a rifle, became a member of Pershing Rifles, uh, so it was good, good training. <laughs> now, at this point, had you had any interest or even experience with flying? I had not. In fact, folks ask me now, how did you get into flying? I literally have to say I was avoiding the draft. <laughs> <laughs> um, as I said, I learned to handle a rifle in ROTC. Uh, because I was in school, however, my draft board wasn't pulling my number. And it turns out that uh, when the uh, opportunity for blacks to get into aviation um, came about. It turns out that uh, the Army had said that they couldn't use any black pilots because they didn't have any black mechanics. So of the now called Tuskegee Airmen, mechanics training took place at Chinook Field, Rantoul, Illinois. That's 14 miles from the university. And of course, we in the community heard, oh, there are blacks in training up at Chinook Field to find out what it was for. I assume my uh, ROTC instructor said, well, you ought to be a pilot rather than a mechanic. <laughs> and I went and passed the pilot exams, and sure enough, he, he was right, because after I got in and got my first flight, I knew I'd ma made the right decision. But that's why I can say I was avoiding the draft. <laughs> well, talk about that excitement. It sounds like there was quite a buzz when you found out the type of opportunity that was available. Well, that's, that's true, because there wasn't a lot of publicity on it. And of course, the, I can understand the Army wasn't publicizing, because they said it was that first authorization of a squadron, the 99th Pursuit Squadron, they expected it to fail, because they said, hey, we've studied the issue of going back to 1925 studies, and, and we know it's not going to be successful. But the pressure's on. Uh, well, experiment mechanics did well. They expect them to fail. They didn't. And then they said, wow, we need an airfield for the pilot training. Airfields all around the country. But again, because of segregation, they found $4 million to build Tuskegee Army Airfield. So uh, Tuskegee relationship has to do with Tuskegee Institute, which was adjacent to the city of Tuskegee, Alabama. And, and as they, they built the airfield about seven miles northwest of Tuskegee Institute location. Let's back up just a tad uh, and go to December 7th, 1941. That's a memorable day for you for two reasons. Oh, my goodness. I it's think your it birthday. was birthday for sure. <laughs> yeah, I can't forget that, that uh, indeed. So it's a memorable day. Uh, and I can remember. Uh, at that time, uh, oh, I was in school. My dad was in G Gary, Indiana, and I was home for a bit and um, was with the Glee Club going to uh, a program in South Chicago when they came over the radio with the president announcing the attack on Pearl Harbor. So 
you're 22 years old. What are you thinking? Oh my goodness. Uh, well, that on that date I was 21, uh, <clears throat> and uh, certainly, uh, well, the country had come out of 10 years of depression. Although it didn't change segregation, everybody was interested in the jobs that became available in the war buildup and enlistments and and all. So there was a focus on what was taking place. Did you feel any sense of, I want to be part of the response to this attack? Well, at that time, and as I look back, I hadn't made a decision where or what, but knew needed to be a, some part of it somewhere or another. And of course, at that time, getting completing the education was the focus, and that's why I was in school. But after I had uh, met the standards for getting into flight school. I was called into service. I had just finished two, year, two years of college. So when were you called into flight school? Uh, that came in October of uh, 1943. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, October is when you're a little bit later. I, um, but October, of 43, well, no, but would, I graduated from school, from flight training, June of 43. So October of 42 it would be, <laughs> would, be, would be, be the correct uh, reporting, reporting time, direct into training, and I assume because of my ROTC, I wasn't sent off to a training school first. What was it like when you got to Tuskegee? Well, that was a, quite an experience to go south. Of course, uh, on the train leaving uh, uh, Illinois, uh, when we crossed the Mason-Dixon line, we had to go to the special car that kept races separated. Uh, and fortunately, in the, the training program, we had a number of cadets who were from the south and familiar, and they kept those of us from the north, they let us know you'd where not to go buy gasoline or, or that, that type of thing to keep us out of trouble. Because it did exist uh, uh, places you just didn't want to go or subject yourself to what might happen if you looked the wrong way or did the wrong thing. Or so <laughs> it was quite an experience. How did you deal with that? Well, the focus was on getting those wings and, uh, and let, uh, let that go by and those not focusing on just being fully aware and being careful of what you did or how you acted. Of course, my own growing up, I always felt whatever the circumstance, treat other folks like I wanted to be treated and uh, uh, that was ki kind of the direction uh, to go. And of course, the focus on the, on the training that became important, and the other things were not primary. How focused were you and the other recruits on proving yourself that you could do this? Yeah, well, actually, I don't know that our focus was quite that much. I think the majority of them were for folks who, as a youngster, either had a ride or saw an airplane and wanted to become a pilot. Uh, I didn't have that aspiration, but uh, uh, did want to. I did want to serve, and fortunately, it came out uh, after that first flight. I've always said I knew I made the right decision because I fell in love with aviation. To be able to go up and loop, roll, and spin, and come back and put your feet on the ground, and after looking over the countryside. I don't know what better could replace. <laughs> it was instantaneous. <laughs> exactly. Wow, that's so cool, so cool. How, we, we've heard about how difficult and rigorous the training was there. How would you describe it? Uh, and looking back and looking at it, fortunately they didn't change the standard and we had excellent training. We had enough folks uh, and of course our instructors in the, in the Army training program were of course white. But, but were instant, they weren't there to change segregation, but they were instant aviation and passing on. And so under the Southeast Flight Training, Com Flying Training Command, we had excellent instruction and the standards weren't changed and we were able to meet them. So 
um, you might say that w as you look back on the whole thing, once given the opportunity, we just dispelled the biases and generalization and thought race, some racist thoughts that because of happenstance of birth, we were less than a full citizen in those physically qualified but mentally and morally inferior to the white man. Um, we dispelled those things once given the opportunity. Did the, the white officers treat you well? Very well. We had only a few occasions and, and more uh, problems came where somebody, when things weren't right, you know, would cuss or use something like that. that there were some little things like that, but by and large, none of that deterred the progress and, and training that took place. And, and fortunately, uh, well, the first command, white commander of Tuskegee Army Airfield was kind of interested in changing, keeping segregation. Um, he didn't want the white person from Tuskegee coming out their base with a black man at the gate with a gun on. But fortunately, I don't know whether you might say, all I can say now maybe his inabilities to do what was required at that time, but he was changed and the uh, commander that uh, Noel Parrish that took his place didn't change segregation, but he fought for the opportunity. Just a, a minute before we have to take a break here, when were you deployed to Europe? We, as I have to say, I graduated in June of 43. Um, the, the four fighter squadrons were fully formed. We did our combat preparation um, in uh, Michigan, uh, Oscoda Army Air Base, and, and Selfridge Field, Michigan, Oscoda, we could do our gunnery out over the lake. December of, of uh, 43, we were combat ready, uh, left training site, ended up um, in Italy in January of 1944. That's now that's part of the unit because the first squadron that uh, was formed, the 99th uh, squadron, had, was already in combat. They were combat ready in December of, of, of 42 and were finally sent to North Africa in spring of 43, um, d attached to white groups but still segregated uh, overseas. And that lasted until um, their segregated as, uh, assignments were ended in uh, July of, of 44. When the group, and they were then assigned to the 332nd Fighter Group, who had, by that time had been gotten into the escort program. And uh, so the 332nd Fighter Group had four squadrons from early July 44 on through to just before the war ended. Colonel, let's take a quick break. We'll be right back with much more of your story on Veterans Chronicles. Thank you. Welcome back to Veterans Chronicles on the Radio America Network. I'm Greg Corumbus, honored to be joined today by retired U.S. Air Force Colonel Charles McGee, veteran of World War II, Korea, and Vietnam, and he's a member of the famed Tuskegee Airmen. And just before we took our break, we were talking about his deployment to Europe. And um, before we get into your first mission, sir, I know that there were a number of different planes you got to fly in your yes. training and in combat, starting with the P-39 <laughs> and eventually the P-51, but what did you start with once we you got We started the, all of the four single-engine fighter squadrons that are part of the Tuskegee program uh, first flew the P-40 Warhawk. Only the 99th Squadron flew it in combat, North Africa, Sicily, and into Italy. Uh, the 332nd Fighter Group, following them, uh, we were combat ready in the P-40 and then they changed and said, oh, Yar, you're gonna do patrol work. And we changed to the P, got checked out in P-39 Bel Air Cobra. It didn't take but a few hours to maintain, maintain the readiness level and we still left the States in December, our training site Christmas of uh, 43 to uh, go overseas. What was that first mission like? You do all this training, but <laughs> now you actually have to do it. What's it well, like? Well, it was a culmination. I say training was good because we started out in 
primary training, 250 horsepower, basic training, 450, and then up to 650 for advanced training, and then jump up into the high thrust of a P40 a after that. So it was a stepping stone, and I would say training prepared us well for, for, for that, that change. It turns out that, uh, however, the aircraft are quite different. P-39 just wasn't an interceptor. Uh, had a cannon through the, that was the one that had the engine behind because they had a cannon in the nose, and, uh, but not, a, not an interceptor aircraft, no speed, uh, no out, high altitude capability. It turns out that in the spring of uh, 44, um, we were all with 12th Tactical Air Force. We were put, the group was patrolling Naples Harbor and the waterways, the Anzio Beachhead, 99th, still flying the P-40, was attached to 79th Group uh, uh, in the ground and interdiction work uh, during the Anzio Beachhead time frame. Um, shot down German aircraft like the other squadrons because of the opportunity. Um, but the group was one of four picked. We thought we had enough guns on our B-17s and B-24s to protect them from the German Air Force. That wasn't the case. Sometime half the squadron was lost. Well, for every plane loss, that's 10 American lives. And so they pulled four groups from 12th Tactical Air Force to move to 15th Strategic Air Force and begin escorting our B-17s and B-24s. 332nd Fighter Group was one of the four. Did you have a relationship with a particular bomber squad, so you worked with the same bomber group all the time, or did it rotate? It, you never knew. We, uh, our operations people who got the orders and helped plan the flights and so on knew the group, but as, as a pilot, I was never given the number of the group we were escorting. Sometimes it could be more than one, depending on how many bombers were on that particular target run and, and time frame as well to uh, meet up with them and be able to carry them over the highly defended area and help get them back uh, uh, safely uh, uh, from, from the def highly defended areas. So it was an interesting uh, bit of operation, but you never knew. Um, Sometimes there were many groups in it. Sometimes it might be just one. How would you describe the formation? What was the strategy for successfully guiding them to their target and back? Yeah. Well, so of course, the first success is being sure to meet them at the rendezvous point uh, and being able, and of course, I like to be in the fighter because uh, once they got on the bomb run, the, regardless of the ground fire, the bombers had to ride it out to put bombs on target. We and the fighters could still protect them and watch over them, but we could get higher above them, out from them, so on. we could move around. We knew the level of the flak. We didn't have to fly down in the flak blanket uh, unless we were dispatched to go try to help one if one was falling out of formation or something like that. Then we would dispatch elements to help protect them as long as we had fuel and help them get back to a safe area to get back home. How would you describe the intensity of the resistance, both either in terms of other pilots from the Germans or the, the ground flak? Well, they were both uh, difficult to face, if you will, because you never knew how many. Uh, but fortunately, as our bombers destroyed Germany's war-making potential, we rapidly reduce that threat, and which helped us bring about a, about a, about a victory there. But uh, I appreciate being a pilot because, like I say, we could see where the high fire was and we could still do our job but move about, get a little bit higher, uh, but still do our job to protect, protect the bombers and for them to, once they got on the bomb run, to have to ride it out. And of course, there were still some losses, but that wasn't what we could control, certainly. And, and then uh, coming off of the target, uh, we stayed with the bombers as long as we had adequate fuel to do it. And, and 
if there were stragglers, we would dispatch an element to stay with them as long as they could to till they got in a safe area. So it was a, quite a task, but we were well prepared for it and had great leadership in that task. Uh, uh, and if somebody might ask the question, well, the 332nd was called and now called the Red Tails, uh, uh, folks often, uh, I'm sure there are a lot of war stories <laughs> about it, but 15th Air Force realized when they uh, called on or established the, the escorts that the gunners need to know that these planes showing up weren't German. And um, of the four groups picked to start that escort work, one was designated yellow tail, uh, one had candy stripe red and white, one had black and, and orange checkerboard, 332nd red tail. That's where that came about and of course the story has been said and part of the research history that uh, although many bomb groups didn't know red tails were black pilots, they were glad to have the red tail escorts show up because of the nature of our leadership and insistence that we stick with the bombers as long as we could. So they knew that you were high quality based on your reputation, but they never actually met you. That's right. Many of them, some groups didn't know even too well after the war that the Red Tails were black pilots. There were some that, uh, in fact, in one case, some bad weather had uh, a couple of the squadrons even landed our field, and uh, they were kept for till the weather allowed them to get onto their base, and they learned. Uh, but but we had, as I say, the segregation overseas. We the Austin's rest camp was on the Isle of Capri. We didn't get there. Mm -hmm. We had a villa up on the hill in Naples uh, because of segregation. But that didn't deter us from, because we were, as I say, had good leadership, had good training, and many, like myself, we were happy to be there doing the job. You're very active in uh, talking about the work of the Tuskegee Airmen and uh, many different military events over many years. What was it like to finally meet some of these bomber crews who you well, helped to shepherd it, safely? You know, it, it's quite a feeling to have someone come up to you and tell you, say, thank you, because my father made it back home because of what, what you did. That, that's, that's very touching, the realizing training paid off, and we were there at the right time and, and did the right job. Uh, um, but and then the value lessons that helped us get through are still good for the young folks today. So that's still a part of the message as we look to keep our Air Force strong and, and healthy and, and capable. And we'll be talking about that much more in just a moment. Colonel, let's take one more break and we'll be right back on Veterans Chronicles. Thank you. Welcome back to Veterans Chronicles. I'm Greg Corumbus, honored to be joined today by retired U.S. Air Force Colonel Charles McGee, veteran of three wars, World War II, Korea, and Vietnam, a yeah. member of the famed Tuskegee Airmen. And there's so much still to get into in our conversation today, sir. Let's uh, start, I believe it was August of 1944, where you had the opportunity to pursue and take down a, a, another German fighter. Yes, the uh, Falkwolf uh, aircraft. Uh, we were escorting uh, bombers that had targets at, uh, at, well, the airfield and the nearby rail marshalling yards were the targets of the day. But it happened that uh, some folk wolf tried to penetrate the uh, bombers we were escorting and happened on the side and where saw them that my element was dispatched. And that's the way we did the lead of the formation would dispatch so everybody didn't turn on them. An element left because the others are still doing their job for the whole whole bomber bomber stream. But uh, the, as I turned into the plane, I uh, guess he thought he could dive away, and so I was able to follow and get on his tail. And all I can say is that, uh, that as we were jinking around is the word we used uh, to, to avoid, but he made made a right turn that put him right in my gun sights where perhaps had he made a left, sharp left turn, I 
wasn't quite in position to fire and down, but but fortunately uh, hit the aircraft in a way that destroyed and the, the plane crashed on on the aerodrome. Wow. What was that like as you well, were pursuing? Well, uh, you got a job uh, after. It, uh, of course, there was a lot of ground fire from forces on on the on the base. Uh, so I just stayed at low altitude, uh, uh, moving away from from from, from the base. Uh, also at the same time, and on the way before I started climbing back to altitude, uh, saw a train pulling into a station, and I uh, fired a uh, damage. The I think it damaged <laughs> the the engine on 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 that that train, and uh, and of course uh, I immediately. Continue my climb on to altitude to join, get back into heading home. Is that your only pursuit? That was the only time my element was dispatched for some. Uh, we did some fighter sweeps when sometimes with the weather or there weren't bombers. Or bo some of the bombers were given given other duties, and and we were free to have a fighter sweep. I think we destroyed more German aircraft on the ground than we did in the air uh, in, in, in those fighter sweeps. And then later in the war, they were also, uh, they had the uh, P-38 was doing uh, reconnaissance. And that was, might be only two or four ship uh, go out and escort them going in because as a single ship, uh, uh, with some areas highly defended, uh, certainly they needed it too. So as the war phased down, the element and nature of some of the support changed, but certainly still uh, a real part of helping uh, win the war. How would you describe the camaraderie at the base? Wonderful. We had good, we developed friendships out of being training together and. In fact, to the point that uh, some folks you only knew them by their their nickname. You didn't even know <laughs> it was you know not uh, well. We like it. had somebody with Jelly Butt Walker, but <laughs> I have no idea what his first name was <laughs> <laughs> or something something like that. Uh, but uh, we were very supportive of each other uh, in, in that respect, and certainly having gone through training together, it was good to be able to support each other in, in the combat zone as well. What's your call sign? Uh, I'll have to remember. <laughs> 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 oh, goodness. Hmm. Boy, my memory isn't helping me on, on, on that right now. Uh, but but each, uh, our group had a call sign, and of course each, uh, in the elements, uh, we use color, in other words, uh, in a, the normal flight of flight of four, uh, four, uh, four flights of four made up the squadron. The squadron putting up sixteen aircraft, and uh, um, gosh, the name isn't coming to me to me right now, but uh, uh, it may come back to you. I also know that you named your plane. Kitten. Yes, oh, that was very popular at that time. Uh, uh, most of the bombers drew pictures on there because <laughs> they had a lot more space than in ours. But I ended up, uh, my wife's name was Kitten, so I put Kitten on mine. But I also liked that because I said my crew chief kept that engine purring like a kitten. So <laughs> <laughs> keep it there. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Fantastic. So later in 1944, they brought you back home. Indeed, in November of 44, uh, I finally had a replacement come in, came back, and where was the assignment after rest camp, Tuskegee. Um, when I graduated in June of 43, my instructor had said, oh, uh, too bad they don't have a bomber program for you guys, because I think you'd make a good bomber pilot. Well, I didn't ask him what he meant, but <laughs> he didn't know they had already approved him three months later medium bomber training started in the Mitchell B-25 at Tuskegee, and although I'm a single-engine fighter pilot, I became a twin-engine instructor and instructed many of the uh, uh, pilots that became a part of the 477th Bomb Group. 
even. They didn't get into combat, but fought the battle against racism here at home in their training. So much a part of the... So now, Red Tails are the folks that got into combat, but uh, the bomb bomber pilots are those that uh, fought segregation to uh, in, in their training. And this happened, well, they were, Colonel Selway wanted to keep segregation, although army regulations had already been written, said there should be no further segregation based on race, creed, or color. And, uh, uh, but he had General Hunter's okay to say that on his base, trainees could only use the facility de designated. And the purpose was they didn't want black officers going to the club because the whites in the club. So he didn't have a white club. No, you can use facility over on the other side of the field. Well, uh, at that time, your club dues were taken out of your pay before you received. So all officers had the right to the club. Um, peacefully in twos and threes, officers of the 477th tried to enter the club, were turned away. Colonel Selway asked them to uh, reread his regulation and sign that they would comply. 101 refused and were immediately shipped off from Godman, uh, from uh, Indiana, where they were in training, to Godman Field, Kentucky, put behind guards, barbed wire, of dogs. In fact, worse treatment than German prisoners of war at the adjacent Fort Knox. Hearing they sent Selway somewhere because they knew he was wrong, but the Army didn't change their policy. I said, well, what do we do? The war is over in Europe. The 332nd is returned. Um, well, we'll have a composite group. We'll keep two of the B-25 squadrons, we'll reactivate the 99th, uh, 477th composite group. Godman Field, oh no. Uh, we'll open up Lockburn Air Base south of Columbus, Ohio. This is now for 1946 time frame. Uh, now Rickenbacker Air Base. Mm -hmm. But that became a segregated base. When training ended in 46, Tuskegee closed. Where'd we go? Lockburn Air Base, Columbus, Ohio. 1947, the Air Force separated from the ground forces. And there were those, although some still, I'm sure, would like to see segregation continue, but there were those who at that time determined that, uh, well, they said, we need to use people based on the training and experience and where needed, not their happenstance of birth. And uh, we're not getting enough money to keep Lockburn Air Base open, but not be able to assign units as, as we would need to to carry out the mission. We should integrate. They were backed by a very courageous President Harry Truman, who was a few months later issued Executive Order 9981, mandating all the services need to integrate. He also issued another at the same time, I believe it was 9980, stating that there should be equal access and equal hiring throughout the federal government. And of course, statements like that uh, uh, against, against segregation, um, uh, they're, they're a statement. Integration is the action, it takes time. The Air Force finally closed Lockburn Air Base 1st of July, 1949. And those of us there were scattered around the world. So, and although the, we didn't see it as civil rights action and so on, you might say that the, the Air Force led our country in, in equal opportunity for all. Describe your reaction to all this. You put your lives on the line to defend mm -hmm. our country, to help win the war in Europe, and then you come back home and you're treated horribly. Yeah. And then two years after that, you've got a president who's standing beside you. <laughs> Yeah. Um, well, as I say, there were those that when the war ended were glad to get out and, and so on. I enjoyed flying and, 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 and what that the opportunity meant. And they had said there before integration that you need to do something else other than fly. Um, 
I chose to go out to aircraft maintenance officer school. You know, some went to intelligence or weather, that's opportunities uh, of their interest. And as I say, there were those who still didn't like the segregated set up and turned away from uh, serving. But uh, because of my enjoyment of, of flying, uh, I was happy to stay, if you will. And although uh, the, the only way I put it now, I couldn't have written a script for better opportunities that seemed to come my way. I didn't ask for them, it just seemed to happen. In other words, after uh, my 100 missions in Korea, I said, well, I'm going to go back to the Philippines to enjoy my overseas tour because they had reopened family travel and joined back. Got my first jet experience and commanded the fighter squadron for two years, doing something to enjoy. Well, what more <laughs> could you ask for? Right. But then coming home, staff school, more assignments, and because of my maintenance and material interest as well as flying, I was put, well, I was sent to Minneapolis, but then there a short time then to headquarters, so a material job in headquarters. Uh, so at that time, uh, my most of my assignments were all uh, in, uh, I call it the heart of America, Richard Gabar Air Base. Well, it was Grandview Air Base very early, then became Richard Gabar, the old Truman Farm okay. <laughs> area. Um, but assignments that uh, serving in headquarters, but still flying. And I ended up actively flying 27 of my 30 years. That's Didn't ask for it, it happened, and I was a happy camper. <laughs> Well, you're also a very humble man because you glossed over the fact that you flew over 100 missions in three different wars. That's, that is true. World War II, uh, Korea and Vietnam. They normally said that they would t take pilots out of combat after 50 missions. That didn't apply to us. So, so I mentioned we flew the P-39 tactical and then a couple of the P-47-51 uh, in the escort work. I ended up with 82 tactical and 54 strategic missions before a replacement showed up because they still wouldn't assign a white graduate to the 332nd fighter group. So I had 136 missions when I came home from Europe. Uh, of course, the standard there in, in uh, Korea was pulling folks out of combat after 100 missions. There were some that flew maybe two or three more before they, they were home, but uh, great experience. And uh, then uh, later I said, well, I also had the Cold War experience, but fortunately it was with the Jupiter missile deployment, so another tour in Italy, but again, commanded in the support squadron for a couple of years in, in that respect. Uh, but my flying then was support aircraft, C-47. I flew our youngsters. Uh, we're in Italy, but our high schools in France, I would, we had students that I'd fly back and forth or fly up northern Italy for some of our supplies. So I, I, as I say, I love flying. And even if they needed an aircraft, not my aircraft, but any aircraft, uh, needed a little test hop after maintenance before it was put back on the line, I made myself available. You were the man. So, <laughs> so tell me about your missions in Korea. What type of missions you know, did they you know, now Looking at the, I call them the, the missions in Europe, the Mediterranean theater, air superiority. In other words, clearing the air so the bombers could do their job, if you will. Um, in Korea, interdiction and ground support. I never saw a MiG because they weren't down in the trees where we were. Mm. You know, but we were carrying napalm, rockets, and bombs, but supporting the ground, ground effort. Uh, and, and then it uh, turns out uh, later when I flew in Vietnam, it was tactical reconnaissance. No weapons. Uh, speed was our defense, but all types of, you know, there's photo, infrared, all types of intelligence gathering uh, equipment to for whatever day day night uh, check of what the enemy was doing on the ground 
So air superiority, interdiction ground support, reconnaissance, um, tactical reconnaissance was three of the phases, if you will, of the Air Force mission that I was able to participate in. It also strikes me, because you mentioned a moment ago that a, uh, shortly after the end of the Korean War, you were assigned to command a flight squadron. Yes. And that's a little more than a decade after just being allowed to be in the military. So exactly. that's quite a You know, a rise. looking back on the experience, and that's why I said I, I feel that I was very fortunate to do well. I'd say two things that I liked. I liked to fly, and I enjoyed working with people. And um, I didn't tell somebody that this is what I want to do. It happened, and fortunately, in all cases, uh, turned tur turned out well. So it was the stepping stones, if you will, that uh, 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 painted a picture of uh, success for me in a way. And and I guess when you look back at it, you can say that it. It had its elements of uh, of understanding that uh, it's not happenstance of birth that's important, but it's your education and training. I was going to ask you what your keys to good leadership are, given the leadership positions you've held, but I think you just told me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's part of it. But one other thing I've always told, uh, and remember I've talked both to Navy and Air Force units on, on occasion, but, but I've, I've said in leadership, you know, everybody has their, those they like and those they like, but I say, uh, don't let it show. Everybody in the unit needs to have the same respect from you. So it's all right to have some buddies, but don't let it show in a way that uh, somebody who thinks they're being left out or not recognized, you're not going to get 100% from them. So I say, if you want 100% from all your people, treat them all alike. Tell me a little bit more about Vietnam. When you were flying reconnaissance missions with no weapons, yeah. did you ever come under fire? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell me about that. How did you? In looking at my war experiences, I didn't get a scratch in Europe and all, the, all that flying. Um, in Korea, uh, firing on gun emplacements on the hillside that were trying to keep our troops from moving across the valley. I'm firing at the gun emplacement and realize, hey, they're firing back. Yeah. <laughs> My plane got hit out in the wing, and I was able to get my plane back to home base. Of course, it was in the wing, not the cockpit. Had the same thing happen in Vietnam. Um, we were letting down over a, a targeted, uh, targeted area, and the plane took a hit, for, again, fortunately, out in the wing. I couldn't get back to home base, so I was able to get to a safe base and turn the plane over, and we were fortunate there. Uh, my weapon system operator was able to pull our film and stuff, and we bummed a ride back to home base, but lost the aircraft. <laughs> Does training just kick in at that point? Is your adrenaline going through the roof? How, that, what's it like? That's, that's why I'm not on youngsters ask, were you scared? That's no, if you're scared, you're in the wrong business. <laughs> <laughs> training, to me, all aspects of, of operations with the right training, you just do it. You know, you know what you have to do. I was, we, we talked about uh, tail, front end tail hook landing. Well, you don't practice it, but when I needed to at that base, I was able to do it because I had no idea whether I had enough you know, brakes, what at other to stay on the runway, so I made a front end approach approach landing, only one in in my career. But it's something that's part of training. You, you know, you do. You don't practice it, but you know what you need to do, and and it's. I guess I don't like. I like to say, with the good training, you just it comes automatic. <laughs> So you spent uh, over 30 years in service to our country, right? Yes. Um, just over here. How would you describe the difference in the attitude 
towards you by the military and society from the beginning of your service to the end of the service? To me, it was, was quite a difference because when I retired uh, from Richard Kabar Air Base, uh, went to work for an industry, and it seemed to me at that time that the I'm trying to think of the right words or the, the best best way to state it that that the service experience gave you something in being on time, where of the job, doing the job, and so on that they were looking for, uh, and uh, so I was hired very easily to end it up, and although my work was in the uh, uh, well, my material experience helped, but the work for for a company in real estate and purchasing, uh, wonderful time. But but the aspect of the company uh, leadership was glad to have the regularness, if you will, of the military experience. One way I can I put it, uh, and and. Uh, so they were looking for us, <laughs> and fortunately, I was able to uh, participate. And then uh, I think a lot of times it's it's attitude and circumstance of where you might be. But I was in Kansas City, Missouri, did a lot of uh, work for the city organizations. And, and in fact, my last paying job, I managed the downtown airport for couple of years uh, and they but that's interesting too because one day my wife said she'd like to go fishing more often and I said I don't really need to be punching the clock and so I turned the airport over to a young man I had hired and uh, took my wife fishing <laughs> good for you good for you she deserves it too yes um, at what point did you realize later on how much interest there was in the story of the Tuskegee Airmen um, it it took a while, you know. <clears throat> I've been asked some time about segregation, and so I don't have anything good I can say about segregation. I said, oh, but, but, uh, I can say one thing good. The fact that we were together from 1941 to 49, lifelong friendships came out of that, in training, in the combat, afterward. But the, um, there were folks gathering Chicago, Detroit, here in D.C., L.A., um, still enjoying that comradeship. So in 1972, we gathered in Detroit and decided to establish Tuskegee Airmen Incorporated, a national organization, three regions. And at that time, as I say, we had gatherings in those, mainly in those four cities, but we organized in three regions and established the uh, organization. Um, one of our members, uh, who later became the first black Fort Clark general, uh, Ch Daniel, Daniel Chappie James, mm -hmm. um, was the, our LA group uh, decided to uh, have a dinner for him. Well, he died a month after retirement. So that dinner became a memorial program in which we established a scholarship fund. And uh, over the years that that fund has grown that for the last several years, we've been giving forty, fifteen hundred dollars $1,500 scholarships uh, supporting. But the Two, two purposes of the national organization. Preserve the history for what it's meant to our country. Motivate youth and aviation space career opportunities. And of course, our focus was on minority youth, but not limited, mm -hmm. any youth. So it's, it's all. And, and that's, that's been, been our purpose over the years since 1972. We've had an annual meeting every year since, uh, an annual gathering in August uh, still. But our numbers, they've 
somewhere along the line, one of the boys decided to put a moniker on us, and those of us with the service experience is called documented <laughs> original Tuskegee Airmen, because, uh, well, there were some wannabes out there, too, and you can hear folks' stories of what they did in combat or something, find out they went <laughs> never made it. <laughs> uh, but so we're now called documented Tuskegee Airmen. Um, but uh, our number is certainly of the uh, 355 that got overseas, that uh, part of the red tail uh, story. We're now down to 12. I happen to be the oldest of the, of, of the 12 that are, are still living that got, got into combat. Mm -hmm. What's it like to see yourself portrayed in a movie or to be receive the Congressional <laughs> Gold Medal? <laughs> well, some folks say, you know, uh, honored uh, long overdue. I didn't see it as overdue, but certainly uh, welcome recognition of what we accomplished and what it meant for the, for the country. And as I say, the value lessons that supported us are still good for the young folks today on what they're facing. So to me, it, w it went together good to, and, and when we speak of the movie, The Red Tail, that uh, George Lucas put out, uh, a lot of people weren't aware still, many years after war. So what was done at that time, the changes that brought about the country, the importance of what the value lessons mean for our youth, that's a good track to be on for today and I'm thankful to have been a part of it and still able to share. What reaction do you get from young people? Very, very interesting. I, the best thing that I always to me is talking to a group, but sometime later, either an air show or something, I have the youngster come up and say they remember what you said and th give you a thanks. Uh, that makes your day. <laughs> keeps you going, and I say, and it keeps me out of the rocking chair. <laughs> <laughs> well, I remember something you said. It was last fall at our uh, American Valor uh, oh, yeah. program, and uh, you and several other of the surviving mm -hmm. Tuskegee Airmen were there, and I believe you were specifically asked about uh, your attitudes coming back from the war and still dealing with segregation. Mm -hmm. And I was struck with the lack of bitterness, the, the mm -hmm. love for your country, regardless mm -hmm. of its flaws and how yeah. you're glad to see the, the progress that's been made. Mm -hmm. A lot of people would have a different perhaps lingering frustration. You didn't. Explain why. Yeah, well, it's hard to say say why, but, but I've always felt that uh, if you give up hope, you're lost already. So don't, don't go that route. <laughs> and I also tell folks, you know, everywhere you can go, look for the good things. There are bad things out there, but you don't have to look that way. Look, look at the good side of what's going on and strive to keep it keep it going on. So to me, it's, uh, uh, I think the other thing when you talk about attitude, someone brought it to my attention that uh, if you put attitude down and then put the numbers where each of those letters is in the alphabet, this spells 100. Really? 100%. <laughs> if you got the right attitude, so <laughs> keep it on the hundred percent side, not something lower uh, at all. Fantastic. Well, I have to ask you one more question. I hope you're not uh, opposed to me letting our audience know that you're 99 years old. Well, not at all. I wouldn't be opposed to that because <laughs> it's been my good fortune, and uh, and uh, folks ask me why or how. I just say life's been a blessing. <laughs> And keep marching on. So Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, your joy for life and your love of this country is infectious, and it's been an honor to be with you today, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity to share. Retired U.S. Air Force Colonel Charles McGee served in World War II, Korea, and Vietnam, and a member of the famed Tuskegee Airmen. I'm Greg Corumbus. This is Veterans Chronicles.